Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. Um, I have two things to cover today and the first one has to do with continuous glucose monitoring. Is it a better idea? So why are we talking about this? Well diabetics are instructed to monitor their glucose levels regularly in order to make better decisions about what to eat, their medication dosages, exercise, other related things. There are numerous methods for checking blood glucose levels, the most popular of which is finger prick testing to obtain a blood sample, which is then placed on a disposable strip and read by a glucose meter. The meter then displays the blood sugar level. The current philosophy of medicine is more is always better, and that's led to the development of ways to monitor blood glucose levels even more frequently. Continuous glucose monitoring involves the use of a tiny sensor inserted under the skin. It stays in place for a few days or a few weeks and then is replaced. The sensor detects glucose levels in tissue fluid and then a transmitter uh, sends the readings from the sensor to a wireless monitor. But according to the National Institutes of Health, and I checked with them first, continuous glucose monitoring devices, quote, are not as accurate and reliable as standard blood glucose meters. The NIH therefore instructs patients to, quote, confirm glucose levels with a meter before taking any action based on the reading. Essentially what they're saying is that these continuous blood glucose meters are meaningless and useless. Now some studies, to be fair, have shown some benefit. I always try to look at both sides of the issues, but there have been some important caveats. For example, researchers with the Institute for Quality and, Effic and Efficiency in Healthcare in Germany analyzed 13 randomized controlled trials that compared CGM, which I'll refer to it from now on here, with traditional blood glucose monitoring. And this study was done in, in uh, 2015. They reported that CGM lowered A1C levels with fewer episodes of hypoglycemia, but cautioned that the benefit was mostly for adult type 1 diabetics. The data did suggest that CGM might be beneficial for children with type 1 diabetes too, but there was not enough evidence to determine whether it would improve outcomes for type 2 diabetics. The group cautioned that studies haven't lasted long enough to determine if it reduces the incidence of cardiovascular disease or the number of deaths or complications from diabetes, and that different studies have have arrived at different conclusions. Um, the studies were clear that patients who use CGM were more likely to suffer from skin irritation. Of course, you're doing something invasive um, as a result of the sensor being applied to the skin and concluded it is therefore still not clear what advantages and disadvantages the, dis these different approaches may have. So it seems to me like we have a whole lot of excitement about something that showed we, we have reason to believe. There's always reason to believe something might work, lots of hypothesizing, but certainly had not been proven to be super effective yet. Other studies have not shown CGM to be effective at all. For example, the use of it uh, did not improve glycemic control or pregnancy outcomes in pregnant women with type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Another study that looked at the use of GCM for pediatric type 1 diabetics concluded that it was no more useful than intermittent finger stick. Uh, so again, uh, sort of like the National Institutes of Health basically saying this isn't any better than what we're already using. Now, one of the limitations in treating diabetics, in my opinion, is the myopic focus on testing blood sugar levels and then at any cost aggressively um, treating them with medication, uh, usually while ignoring strategies that would be much more helpful to both type 1 and type 2 diabetics like improved diet, exercise, weight loss, etc. Uh, diabetes medications, and I think probably you all know this, but they're not approved based on their ability to treat diabetes or to improve the person's health. They are approved basically because they just lower blood glucose levels. Um, and so consequently, studies have shown that they're good at doing that, but they don't improve health outcomes. In fact, the opposite is true. These drugs often lead to uh, a decline in health outcomes. I'll give you an example. One drug you've probably heard a lot about is Avandia. It does reduce A1C levels by an average of 1.5 percentage points. It reduces fasting glucose by 76 milligrams per deciliter. It reduces insulin resistance by 25%. Well, so far so good. You're probably thinking, what's the problem? Right? Well, the problem is that an analysis of 40 studies showed that diabetic patients who took this drug had 66% more heart attacks, 39% more strokes, and 20% more deaths from cardiovascular disease. Others have shown the same result. When you aggressively lower blood sugar, uh, blood glucose levels with medication, outcomes become worse and worse. Weight gain, higher cholesterol, higher triglycerides, higher blood pressure, more heart disease, stroke, and death. And there are lots of references I've provided in this article. 
Now, to be clear, some diabetics clearly do need medication. A type 1 diabetic will require insulin for the rest of his or her life, and some type 2 diabetics require uh, some type of medication, at, at least temporarily in the beginning, until they can reorganize the way that they eat and exercise and get themselves to the place where they have a chance to improve their health. Um, diabetics, I think, should be concerned about their glucose levels, but encouraging different methods of testing is not the answer. Let's do everything you can to improve the person's health um, through diet, exercise, weight loss. Studies have been very clear that you can lower insulin uh, requirements in type 1 diabetics. You can improve meaningful markers of health, like cholesterol for type 1 diabetics. A lot of type 2 diabetics end up eating their way entirely out of their disease. And, and not having to put it in remission, not having to worry about it anymore. So um, it's amazing how much we focus on the wrong thing in medicine, and then we wonder why we spend all this money and things just don't get better. All right. Um, second topic. Um, some of you who've been around for a long time know that I have a smoothie every morning made with a bunch of superfoods here uh, from Wellness Forum Health, one of which is high-quality food-grade green tea. I've been doing it for almost 20 years. That goes in my smoothie. There are thousands of studies published in medical journals showing that green tea is beneficial for health. The health-promoting effect of green tea on various conditions is attributed, at least in part, to both polyphenols and catechins, which are really powerful antioxidants found in green tea. Many studies have shown that green tea and or its constituents can be an effective adjuvant for cancer treatment. In fact, according to Dr. Ralph Moss of CancerDecisions.com, there are thousands of studies that have looked at green tea and cancer, 1,300 of them alone looking at uh, a polyphenol called epigallocatechin, um, I'll call it EGCG, how about that, and cancer. One example of, um, of studies that have looked at uh, the relationship between green tea and cancer is based on uh, the research by James Morey and Dorothy, Dorothy Morey at uh, Purdue University who discovered a surface protein on cancer cells called ENOX2. And uh, what this does, this surface protein enables young cancer cells to increase their size and also prepare for replication. Green tea is one of uh, several substances that can inhibit ENOX2 and perhaps reduce cell proliferation. Now one of the limitations on research that I've found as I've been looking for research studies on green tea is reductionism. Very common in uh, research on diet and health. And the reductionism goes two ways. One is looking at nutrients from green tea instead of green tea. And then the other is looking at green tea and or nutrients without any other changes made. If everybody wants to find a magic food, a magic nutrient, that's not the way you address healthcare issues. Well, I did find a recent study that looked at the effect of green tea, like the whole thing, on men with cancer, uh, prostate cancer. 113 men with prostate cancer were randomized to consume six cups of brewed green tea daily, brewed black tea or water before undergoing radical prostatectomy. Men who drank green tea showed a significant drop in nuclear factor kappa B, a marker for aggressive cancer, and a significant drop in PSA levels. T polyphenols were found in the prostates of these guys, and 32 out of 34 of them uh, who drank the tea, but none in the men who were drinking black tea or water. The authors concluded, quote, future long-term studies are warranted to possibly examine the role of green tea for prostate cancer prevention and treatment, and possibly other prostate conditions like prostatitis. Now, I will continue to enthusiastically promote the use of green tea to our members. It, it needs to be high quality green tea, a lot of caveats with this, okay? Um, but there are some statements that accompany, first of all, you have to make sure that the quality of the tea is good, please don't buy it off the shelves in the stores. Um, the second thing is that green tea is fabulous as it is, I don't kid myself about this issue either, it's not a magical food, so I don't tell myself by putting green tea in my smoothie every morning, I've done everything I need to do to improve my health. It's the totality of the diet that's important. And uh, so green tea is a great addition to an excellent health-promoting diet. It is not a substitution for a health-promoting diet. All right, that's all for today and for the week. As always, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you next week with more news.